Hey there, art nerd. Are you on the market for a good round watercolor block? I am too. I'm Becca Hilburn and I'm a watercolor artist, illustrator, and comic artist. I am crazy about watercolor. If you guys aren't new to the channel, this might look a little bit familiar. Not super long ago, we re-reviewed the smaller round Paul Rubens block. I had some issues with it. I just didn't love it as much as I love some of the other Paul Rubens products that we've reviewed. Since then, we have looked at a lot of different things from Shanghai Aowen, Paul Rubens' parent company. We've looked at a lot of round watercolor blocks and we've done a lot of painting together. So today, I want to find out if this larger watercolor block addresses some of the problems that I had with the smaller block. If you're on the market for a good round watercolor block I think you're in the right place so let's find out together whether or not this block is up to snuff if it is worth your buck we're gonna put it through a series of tests including a field test where I'm going to paint a mermaid holding a frog in watercolor for you guys so I hope you guys are ready to do some testing and to do some painting and to see if Paul Rubin's block is worth your buck there art nerds so a while back i unboxed and swatched this teeny tiny paul rubens watercolor round and while it was really promising at first i kind of struggled with it when it came to using it for actual watercolor i found that it had some traits that i just really struggled to work around and one of those was the sort of resist along the edges where the glue is probably meeting the paper and I theorize that perhaps these issues wouldn't be so egregious if I were working in a larger size. So today I have a much larger Paul Rubens watercolor round. So this is 100% cotton. It's going to be about 140 pounds. So 300 GSM, about this weight, about the thickness of card stock. It has a cold press texture, so that means it actually has some surface tooth. There are 20 pages in this block, and it is 25 by 25 centimeters, approximately, just kind of giving it an estimate, about 12 inches across. And this is a block bound cotton watercolor pad. So hopefully, this much larger size is going to perform a lot better. And then First of all, I'm going to do a mud test on it where I do three layers of watercolor, one layer per day, and I, I totally saturate the paper, throw a whole bunch of pigment on it, let it dry, rinse and repeat over the next two days, and then I want to create a watercolor illustration on it to field test it and see if I like it any better in this size than I did in this size. So let's go ahead and unbox and field test this watercolor pad together. With our Paul Rubens round, I have a Paul Rubens shuriken. So what I want to do is I want to try and find there is an opening down here at the bottom that we can delicately and gently insert our, you can use a palette knife. I've used butter knives. I've, I, I'm not recommending this, but I have also used X-Acto knives. I find palette knives and uh, these kind of weird little shurikens to work the best. Hopefully we will not tear the paper. I am trying to be pretty careful, but it also shouldn't be that delicate. Okay, the moment of truth. So there is a little bit of damage down here. Um, and I had noticed that my pad arrived a little bit dinged up. Hopefully though, that won't be too bad. There's also a little bit of like glue or fluff residue down here and that did cause a problem uh, when I was doing the smaller block. This actually kind of creates a resist and the texture on the paper is 
fairly regular, but not too regular. So I'm looking forward to saturating this with a whole bunch of water and seeing how well it holds up. For our first layer, I really saturated the paper and added a bunch of granulating colors. So undersea green, some darker cool green that Daniel Smith makes, as well as Indian yellow, Queen Gold, Indigo, and Thalo Blue to see how these colors dry on this paper. The paper does kind of buckle and kip as it stretches and absorbs the water. I think this is since we're working with a larger size. Water control is a lot easier on this paper than it was on the Arteza round I reviewed earlier this year. I noticed yesterday's colors dried with some granulation, which is great to see. I applied a second layer of the same colors, adjusting their placement to see how well they layer. There was some color movement, though it was minimal, when I applied an all-over wash of water. Water tends to want to pool around the edges, although the pad itself holds well. It's large enough that the paper does buckle a bit when you really saturate it. That's going to become a major issue while we're working on the field test, and we'll talk about that more later on. This pad handles a lot of color well and it dries flat. The only buckling is the opening for your palette knife, which isn't too bad and honestly that's kind of to be expected. The weird rim that we saw with the smaller round is less noticeable with the larger round, maybe because just the ratio is different. We have more paper compared to the circumference than we did with the smaller round. been four days since we started our journey with the Paul Rubens larger watercolor round and I think it held up pretty well. We didn't have any catastrophic fails which is pretty dang good. So now we need to use this palette knife. We're going to insert it into the opening over here and we're going to work our way around to remove our watercolor from the block. Felt like it maybe had come a little bit loose over here, but that was kind of the only area. And we do have some seeping where I really saturated. So keep in mind, I did this over three days. Each day I really saturated it with water and color. We didn't have any bleed through here, but we did have some bleed through around the edges. So that's definitely something to keep in mind. The middle sections seem like they can handle it a little bit better. The edges, not so much. So now that we've taken a look, we've done our mud test, I think it's time for us to do our field test. For the field test, I wanted to do something mermaid inspired. So I started with a really rough thumbnail sketch, took it into Photoshop, adjusted it and really worked on it. And then I printed it out and I penciled it with red lead. I've applied graphite to the back of my paper and I'm going to do a graphite transfer. I'm just using the tape to hold it in place. Graphite transfer can be a great way to get your digital art or your art on a different type of paper that you're more comfortable sketching on. It can be a great way to get that onto your watercolor paper, especially if it's block bound or in an unusual format that wouldn't work well going through a printer. As you guys might have noticed, I've been playing around with my different editing techniques. Let me know what you guys think. TikTok's been a big inspiration for me in trying to just do different things. I've also been trying to do more stop motion animation because that's a long-term passion of mine. So if you like it, do let me know. So for the field test, I wanted to use Paul Rubens with Paul Rubens and I am 
using the Paul Rubens Tubins palette because I love the colors in this palette. They're very inspiring to me and they just seemed to really lend themselves to kind of a mermaid piece of art. I propped up my block with a roll of tape just so that gravity can be our friend and kind of help us out. And I'm applying a toning wash all over the illustration to kind of help set the stage. So for this field test, I really want to try a bunch of different things to throw as many things as I can at it. And I want to treat it like I'm just painting. So I'm going to be doing a lot of different watercolor techniques today to see how well this block holds up. And that includes a lot of underpainting and glazes to really kind of try to set the mood for this illustration. So my mermaid was inked with a Sakura Pigma FB brush pen. That's one of my favorite brush pens. It is both waterproof and alcohol marker proof. So if you like brush pens and you're looking for a brush pen that can stand up to watercolor, that is a great one to choose. While inking this, I do want to point out that the texture of this paper is fairly assertive and it might cause spluttering with like dip pens. I like an assertive cold press paper texture though. I think it really adds a lot to the art. So I don't mind that so much. Even though we're really talking about the round watercolor paper, I want to take a moment to talk about Paul Rubens paints. I am a big fan of their tube paints. I really enjoy painting with them. I fell in love with them way back when I did the field test and they're just kind of a delight. And this particular palette, the colors in this palette are just really inspiring for me and easy to use. They're kind of more floral inspired, so they work well with my art. If you're interested in Paul Rubens watercolors, I've reviewed several of them here on the channel. And while I I have my preferences. I do prefer their tube sets put into their palette. Um, their half pans are also very good. I just like the tube set just a little bit better and it works a little bit better with how I like to paint. I'm also painting with a Paul Rubens quill. This came as a free pack-in on the Paul Rubens half pants set I reviewed for you guys a while back. And I was kind of surprised because I love this quill. I thought it was going to be terrible, but it is one of my favorite brushes. And I've ordered some more Paul Rubens paint brushes. A, because I think they're probably going to be great because the quill is great. And B, I wanted to share that with you guys. So keep an eye out for that. So I am trying something kind of different with masking fluid. So I'm using Winsor Newton's removable tinted masking fluid in a dinky dip like I always do. I'm applying it with a synthetic brush. But normally I wouldn't cover such a large area with masking fluid because I typically don't have the best results with that and that's gonna kind of come up again later. I'm using that technique where I'm covering all of the mermaid and it does make mask and and all the lily pads and the water lilies as well and it does make painting a lot easier because I'm not having to work around it. I can just kind of paint on top of it but I found that later on when I removed the masking fluid it really tugged and warped the paper and the pad itself was just not really able to hold it tight enough to compensate for that. And that's a problem I haven't really encountered too much before, but I also typically don't try to cover larger areas with masking fluid. There are a lot of artists who do and they do it to great results. I don't necessarily know why I had such a problem with it or why I always seem to have such a problem with it, but it did affect negatively impact the paper and it negatively impacted some of the techniques that I wanted to do later on. So I did think it was important to kind of disclose that and explain it. And when using masking fluid, I do try to always be careful to make sure the paper is fully dry before I apply my masking fluid and make sure my masking fluid is fully dry before I paint on top of it or I try to remove it. That's just some best practice. It's I have found that it gives me the best results. Now you're gonna see my nose kind of popping in and out sometimes. Uh, well, that happens not infrequently. I have a big nose and I'm leaning over very close and trying to work around my camera. So it's just one of those things that will happen from time to time. And I wanted to acknowledge it to you know, let you guys know that I am indeed actually aware of it. So not only did I mask out the mermaid and the water lilies and the lily pads, and those big lily pads are, I believe like Victoria Amazonian lily pads. Dang it. I used to know it and I have since forgotten it. 
but uh, I'll try to make sure I have that info for you guys down in the description below. I'll also have a link where you can get this pad if you are interested in buying this pad for yourself, as well as other videos I think you guys will enjoy, as well as the materials used in this tutorial slash demonstration slash field test. So if you want to paint along, those will be available for you guys. So I'm also kind of masking out some of the highlights on the water so that we have kind of like a light effect, like the light is hitting the water and reflecting off of the water. I'm also masking just the edge of her tail. So I didn't mask off all of the mermaid. I want her tail to be a little bit translucent and I'm also doing some splatter effect. So I'm gonna spend a lot of time trying to build up the water so that we have kind of that like murky Louisiana bayou water going on where sometimes it reflects the sky, sometimes it's brown, sometimes it's green. I'm gonna be doing a lot of layers of this, a lot of wet into wet into this. I'm also going to be allowing it to dry and then masking it off again. I am putting a lot of water onto this paper. And part of that is because I labored under the delusion that this is 100% cotton paper. I thought the smaller pad was 100% cotton. I thought this pad was also 100% cotton. It is actually only 50% cotton. The packaging actually says cotton on it. It doesn't mention that it also includes cellulose, but this is a mixed fiber paper. And generally I don't really have the best experiences with mixed fiber papers. In fact, I kind of feel like mixed fiber papers represent the worst attribu attributes of both papers pretty frequently. It's just kind of unpredictable because it doesn't really handle like a cellulose and it doesn't really handle like a cotton rag. But for the majority of this field test, I thought this was 100% cotton and I was very satisfied with how it handled. I do think that some of the paper warping when I remove the masking fluid later on might be due to the fact that it's a mixed fiber and I treated it like it was 100% cotton. That might be part of the problem. But in general, this paper seems like it can handle a lot of layers, a lot of water. It can handle a lot of working. So overall, I was really pretty impressed with how it handled. Now, personally, for these kind of illustrations, I would rather work on 100% cotton rag. It's just easier to do what I want to do with it. And I have reviewed quite a few now round watercolor blocks. There's something about the format that I really like. Some of them are 100% cotton. Some of them are mixed fiber. So I'm starting to get kind of a feel for these. I've also been reviewing watercolor blocks on the channel for a while now. It's actually not my most popular thing to review people typically don't watch those reviews and that's fine, but I've noticed a lot of failure points when it comes to watercolor blocks, which is why I test them in the way that I test them. And it's why I bring up some of the points that I bring up with a lot of blocks. The glue will start to fail if you add too much water and the block itself will either break or the page you're working on will start to come loose. And that's not what you want from a watercolor block. The whole point of working on a block is that it holds your paper tight while you're painting so you don't have to stretch it. So I added some more layers to the water, allowed that to dry. Now I'm masking off the rest of her tail. I'm also masking off more and more of the water as I build up those layers so that we can kind of build up a reflection on the water surface itself. And I do want to let you guys know that while working on this piece, I had several reference images pulled up. I frequently reference things as I'm drawing and painting. I heavily recommend that you do the same. We cannot be expected to know everything. And even though my art style leans towards more whimsical and cartoony, I still like to be able to realistically <laughs> depict certain things. I want things that I paint to feel sort of real. So I'm painting the background now and I'm adding in some cool yellow or yeah, cool yellow and some green. I'm also going to start painting in the sky and it's so far back and so hard to see. Honestly, in retrospect, I wish I'd left it just water. I wish I hadn't done a horizon line on this or I had done the horizon line at her eye line. That would have made more sense, but that's okay. Uh, hindsight is 2020, and these reviews kind of give me a chance to critique, critique my own work, but I don't want to fall into it too, too much, not because I don't want to learn or improve, but I, I feel like it could be maybe a little discouraging to hear an artist just 
constantly nitpick and critique her own work the whole time. I don't know. Y'all let me know what y'all think. Do you like it? Does it bother you? Do you find it educational? Or do you find it to be kind of discouraging and you wish I would just focus on the painting itself? Let me know how you guys feel about it. I, When I hear other artists doing it, as long as they're doing it in kind of a positive improvement slash growth mindset, I'm cool with it. But if they start dogging on their own art, it's like, well, why would I watch you if you're just going to dog on your own art? So I'm trying to render in, or I am rendering in the trees in the background. This is also me working heavily from the reference to get an idea of how trees in the extreme background would look. And I'm trying to handle them very simply and treat them mostly as masses because they're so far in the distance, you wouldn't see a lot of detail. And I don't want to kind of overly work or overly muddy this piece by adding in too much detail. Now, one of the things that I like about this palette is there's several colors that are quite opaque. So they work really well for adding back in those details and for kind of clarifying things and cleaning things up. everything's had kind of a chance to dry and I've worked on my background, I'm going to start removing my masking fluid so that I can start painting my mermaids and the water lilies. And this is where I first kind of started regretting this technique of using masking fluid to fill in the whole water lily. What I could have done is I could have filled like done a pretty wide outline inside, so inline, I guess, of masking fluid just to kind of block it off and make it easier to paint around it without filling in the entire thing. But I do think the removal of the masking fluid and me kind of tugging at the paper caused the paper to warp. And I feel like it made the paper more prone to buckling and it made it dry kind of buckled. And that definitely made it challenging to do the fine details and the re-inking for clarity that I wanted to do later on in this piece. So if I were to go back, I would probably still use masking fluid, but I do a much lighter application of it and I would um, not cover as much of the paper with masking fluid as I did. Once I remove the masking fluid from the mermaid and the lily pads, I'm going to go in with some indigo and I'm going to start painting in kind of the shadows on the lily pads. I'm going to be using a bright semi opaque green to paint these. So doing a little bit of grise first is going to be a lot easier than trying to glaze the same color on top of it and expect you know, good results. Also by doing this kind of shadow painting earlier on, it helps me keep my light source more consistent because I'm not as worried about the colors. I'm more concerned about actually capturing the light and shadow. With this watercolor field test, I kind of threw everything under the sun at this paper because I was, again, working under the understanding that this is a 100% cotton paper. And I do wish Paul Rubens had disclosed on the packaging, I don't mean on the AliExpress listing, I don't mean on the Amazon listing, which does actually disclose that it's, I think, 50% cellulose. Um, I want the packaging to actually say that. It just says cotton on it. And any watercolor artist is gonna assume that that means 100% cotton because otherwise it would also say something like acid free, which is usually the tip off that the company is also using cellulose. Now, mixed fiber is not uncommon for cheaper watercolor pencils that want to appeal to people who have slightly more expensive tastes, like the Martini rounds are mixed fiber paper and the, there's there's a bunch of stuff. I'm so sorry. I'm blanking on it right now. Uh, 
Fabriano Studio, I believe, is like mixed fiber as well. There's a few out there. Um, that I just typically avoid them unless there's a specific reason for me to check them out, whether it's a format that I like or a color that I like or a finish that I like. Generally, I just avoid them because I personally like watercolor papers that behave predictably so that I can use a variety of techniques on them. Like the spray technique that we have here, I really wanna encourage that green to kind of bleed out into the water so that it kind of looks like the reflection of the lily pad on the water is influencing the color of the water. So using some spray, just some water in a spray bottle, I can start to introduce that. There are a lot of aspects of this that are also pretty straightforward, like using Opera Rose to start rendering the water lilies. It's a beautiful color and I just love how it mixes with yellows and oranges. Now, the sad thing is, is Opera Rose is very light fugitive. So if I were to sell this piece to someone, I would need to disclose to them that I did use some fugitive pigments. but. Opera Rose is very common. It's a fairly popular color, especially in botanical painting. So it, that would not be an unusual thing to disclose. Also give it a spritz of water to encourage some of the colors to move and start to blend and interact with each other. I find that it helps prevent some of the things I paint from looking like they're just floating in the painting. It makes them feel more grounded and like they have more of a sense of place. So for the mermaid, I wanted to go with kind of an unusual skin tone. So I'm going to go with dark bluish greenish black for her hair and then a bluish green for her skin. I, I just kind of imagine her as like a swamp mermaid and that's a color palette that seems like it would work. to start with an indigo grise just to kind of set the tone and start getting those shadows in early and also make it feel like she's actually in this place and the colors of this place are affecting her skin tone. So I keep going back and forth mentioning the cotton or rather the content of this paper being 50% cotton. 50% probably cellulose pulp, but also mentioning how many different techniques that I've tried out or how much fun I've had. And that's definitely something I want to point out. I had a lot of fun painting this. I really enjoyed myself. I don't have a lot of notes for the field test because I kind of just fell into the moment and enjoyed painting it. And that's a good sign for me when a field test isn't an uphill battle of me figuring out how to make this art supply work and how to make it do what I want it to do. And it just works or it just works with you or you're just able to kind of use it. The only reason I keep bringing up the paper content is because the packaging doesn't. And I don't want anyone to be tricked the way I felt like I was kind of tricked. I want you guys to know what you're getting into if you do decide to buy this paper. Paper. But I like the format and larger round cotton rag blocks can be really price prohibitive. And this block was $15.98, $15.98 at the time of review, which is like a steal because I, when I was working on the voiceover for this, I looked up the first review and I think I paid like $20 for that tiny little round block. Good night. That's a lot of money for such a tiny block, especially because this one is much cheaper than that one. But when you buy things on AliExpress, when you buy things on Amazon, the prices do have a tendency to fluctuate. So you might just want to kind of keep an eye out. I can't guarantee that it's going to be 15 ish dollars when you buy it. So I wanted to kind of make sure that my water lilies feel like they're part of the environment feel like they're influenced by the colors around them. So I'm doing a little bit of indigo, not really a grise, a glaze of indigo on top of our initial layers of pink, just to give them a better sense of placement. I'm also going to go in and tighten up some of the shadows on the water lily so that they just feel not necessarily more realistic, but kind of more grounded and like there's more lighting going on.
This is kind of what I mean by I forgot I was doing a field test. Like I never forgot I was doing a field test, but I also forgot to take notes. I just kind of went back and forth noodling around and playing with things and adjusting things and seeing how I felt about them and, you know, just kind of adjusting them and lifting them and working them as I went. And I wasn't really like thinking about having to do things in a certain order to get the best results. So with papers that aren't so great like certain cellulose papers I have to be really methodical in how I go about handling the paints because they do not take glazing well they will re-lift up they or they'll lift up they'll kind of reactivate they'll turn to mud they can be very finicky so I kind of wasn't thinking about any of that when I was doing this I've also painted on some cotton rag papers that were also extremely temperamental and just bled all over the place and just misbehaved and were just a total bad fit for my kind of art and the kind of art that I wanna make. And that's actually one of the reasons why I think it's really important to kind of talk to you guys about what kind of art I make and what you guys can expect from me because different papers are going to suit different artists. Not every paper is going to be a good fit for you. That doesn't make it necessarily a bad paper or a poor quality paper. It just means that the use case you have is not a good fit for that paper. So as you guys can probably tell, I love watercolor. I love layers. I love playing around with it. I have an illustrative style. I'm a watercolor comic artist. So usually when I'm messing around with watercolor, I'm painting on Canson Montval, which is a cellulose paper, but it's a nicer one and it works well for my comic pages. And I'm working with professional grade watercolor paints because I can kind of count on them to do what I want them to do. I don't have any weird problems like I get sometimes when I'm reviewing student grade watercolors and I tend to draw a lot of really tiny faces because one, I'm a comic artist, so multiple panels on a page means the faces get smaller and two, my comic is about tiny people. So I draw a lot of teeny tiny little faces on a, a few on occasion really big faces as well. So I really like kind of whimsical, soft, fairy tale-esque art. I love magical realism. I like to kind of, I like to create the kind of art that gives you, makes you kind of look at the world around you with different eyes and helps you see kind of the magic in everyday moments. And I like when my art supplies support that. I like those like, aha, magic moments with the watercolor when they do something just really beautiful or really effortless. Like I love the kind of glow you get when you combine opera, like we're doing here, with a warm yellow or an orange's color. It's just this beautiful warm glow. It's more than the sum of its parts and it just kind of starts to feel like magic. And that's what I want my art to encapsulate. Now, if you're more of a loose, like watercolor florals sort of artist, you'd probably really like this paper too, because this paper is capable of a lot of nuance. It's capable of some really beautiful, soft, misty techniques. It handles granulation well. So it could be good for like really big, juicy, loose florals. I could see somebody really painting like a beautiful bouquet or a beautiful wreath on this paper. I think that would work well. And I think it would, because you see how bright and vibrant the colors still are, even though I've done like a billion layers on it. I think if you were working with professional grade watercolors on this paper for those kind of florals, this paper would back you up. It'd have your back, it'd be there for you. Now, removing it from the block is really where I started to see some of the problems, but the painting aspects were really a joy and I had a lot of fun with it. And the price point is also great. When, when I talk about like, and I don't know if Paul Rubens considers this a student grade product, but since it's a mixed fiber paper, I kind of consider it a student grade product. When I talk to you guys about student grade products and how they should perform, they should be less expensive than professional grade products and maybe not last as long. And maybe you can't do everything you want to, but you should be able to do a lot of the same techniques that you would be able to do on a professional grade paper because that's how you're going to learn by being able to do those techniques and practice those techniques. You can do those, I feel, on this paper. I mean, 
I feel like I threw everything and the kitchen sink at this paper. I reworked some areas. I did a boatload of wet into wet. I did like a million layers. I did grise. I did glazing. I did masking fluid. I did opaque colors. I did granulating colors. I did a lot of work on this. There's a lot of layers and a lot of kind of going back and forth and finessing it into what I want it to be. And overall, I was pretty happy with it. I think my big mistake with this was that I uh, covered too much area with my masking fluid and maybe was a little too assertive in how I removed my masking fluid. I might use maybe just to mask off like the highlights on the water or maybe some splatter techniques. I certainly wouldn't try to cover as large areas as I did. I think that did kind of damage the paper. But I was always careful in applying it when the paper was fully dry and removing it when the paper was fully dry. And as I'm watching myself repaint this, I have to say, <laughs> this is so beautiful in the video. And I was looking at it the other day because I was teaching a class and I brought my portfolio with me. And it's just not nearly as vibrant as it is here. And I didn't do any kind of weird color. So when I'm recording, I'm always trying to make sure you guys see what I see in real life, that it is as close as possible. I use full spectrum lights. My studio is lit up like the sun. I want you guys, especially with these kind of reviews, to see the same colors that I'm seeing, to see the same effects that I'm seeing. If something ends up drawing really dull, I need you guys to be able to see that. So I'm always trying to capture things as realistically and authentically as possible. And oh, the fact that my hair is in the shot is driving me nuts. I'm so sorry about that. It just looked a lot duller in my portfolio than it does here. And then I remembered it being, and I'm wondering if the color shifted or if I should maybe use this piece as a chance to experiment with varnishing a watercolor illustration and seeing if that brings back some of that beautiful vibrancy that we have going on here. I also have a scan of it that's pretty color accurate that I may need to revisit because if the colors did shift, that is also something we need to talk about and we need to investigate and I need to figure out if it's this paper or if it's the Paul Rubens Tubins, but I have a different illustration that I painted with the Tubins that I painted on Stonehenge watercolor paper that is still really bright and vibrant. So it could just be the Tubins on this paper. I'm not sure, but now that I'm talking about it, I'm like freaking myself out and I'm gonna have to go look at it. But you know, if you would like to compare it, I do have photos of this piece up on my Instagram. I think I have the process up as well. And you guys can check me out at Instagram.com slash NatoSoup. I had kind of given up on Instagram for a while because it really doesn't do much for me. But I got kind of guilted into going back. So I've been trying to share art to Instagram and to the YouTube community tab and to Twitter and to my Facebook Nato Suit page regularly. So if you like my art, those are some ways that you can kind of keep up with it. Or you can get my art in your inbox. You don't even have to do anything. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to remember anything. It comes to you in your email. If you join my studio mailing list, it's totally free. I would never charge you guys for that and it's not only the inside scoop on what I'm working on and my process but you also get access to my art and you can sign up at natasoup.com slash art nerds and if you sign up you get my manga madness drawing class where I teach you how to draw faces and create your own unique characters totally for freezies. I think that's a pretty great deal. So while I was yammering away at you guys, I did a lot of finessing and added a lot of layers and did some spritzing. I mean, I'm not joking when I say I really, really put this paper through the ringer. I really worked this paper and just in general, I didn't have like super many problems. Is that grammatically correct? I didn't have a lot of problems. And for most of the painting, it didn't really stand out to me. 
Um, I even did some glazes as you guys see I'm doing here. I'm kind of trying, I'm trying to kind of create a bit of a vignette around it and kind of just darken it to give it kind of more of a sense of place and to make the contrast on the mermaid herself pop a bit. So I'm using a bluish green kind of around the edges to just darken it a bit so it's like she's more centered if that makes sense. And this is a technique that I've used quite a few times, but generally only on cotton rag papers that I trust and that I feel like it's not gonna just turn to total mud soup on me. And for this illustration, I've been working, other than when applying my masking fluid, I've been using soft watercolor brushes. So the Paul Rubens Quill, which is very soft and springy, I love it. And silver black velvet watercolor brushes. Now I'm gonna go into that background and this is where the opacity of some of these colors is mwah, wonderful because it allows me to paint the reflection of the grasses I think it's like cattails in the background on the water itself and you guys can actually see it I can also use that same yellow just to add kind of a bit of a pop of highlight to the lily pads just to make them look a little bit more vibrant and a little bit more fresh and I'm gonna apologize for my hair again Oh, I'm so, so sorry. I wish my camera would beep at me or something. Do you guys, people who've hung out with me for a really long time can remember when my whole entire head would occlude the camera. And I hated that and I'm so sorry. And that was back when we had a video editor editing my stuff and I wish he would have just cut that out, but he didn't. Now I edit my own stuff and uh, I'm just gonna leave the hair in there because the amount of working around it to cut it out would, I don't think benefit the video much and it would probably be very distracting and noticeable that I did a lot of chopping things up. So we are just going to chalk that up to the fact that I am a human being who makes mistakes and things happen and that's okay and it doesn't make the end piece any less beautiful and it doesn't make what we have to say here today any less valid. It's just some hairs that are kind of annoying. Now I wanted to kind of capture the beautiful like rust-ish reddish color that some of these have, some of these lily pads have. So I'm using, I think it's the opera red. It's one of the really beautiful intense pinks. And I'm just kind of layering it on top of it because optical mixing will do our work for us and it will give us kind of this beautiful, almost brownish color, but it kind of ties back in with the water lilies that are around our mermaid. And I'm gonna do a little bit of self critique again. If I were gonna go back and paint this, I actually wouldn't have as many water lilies as I have here. I would have far fewer because that would make them much more special. Although it's really the frog who's the special guy here today. And I think I would have done the frog in a con, maybe more blue. I don't know, it's hard to say because American bullfrogs are greenish. They're either greenish yellowish or greenish bluish or greenish brownish. There's only so many colors you can go with. They gotta blend in with the swamp. So to have him contrast, maybe what I could have done was draw him sitting in the water lily. And then we have that pop of green against the pink. But that's just like a little bit of self critique. So when I'm doing these field tests, obviously I want to make beautiful illustrations that you guys will enjoy and that I will enjoy painting and that maybe theoretically I could sell or make stickers of or do something with it. But it is, I, I, I do so many of these that it's not like any one of these is like the end all be all penultimate piece that I'm going to dedicate my whole too. So I, I crank out a lot of pieces that if they just had a little more time to bake, they would have been better. And I do tend to get over ambitious. I'm a more is more kind of person. I'm a tacky person. Like I say that proudly. Um, I, I love camp. I see nothing wrong with camp. So I went more is more here. But if I had been more strategic with the number of water lilies and the placement of the water lilies, I could have directed the eye more efficiently. And I think that would have made for a stronger piece. So there's always me juggling my taste level, which is dubious anime kid who likes fairy tales and bright colors with like 
what works for art. And that could be like a whole nother conversation of learning the rules of art, even if you have no intention of ever doing fine art, even if you love anime and you love camp and you love tacky and you just want to make comics like me. It's important to kind of learn those rules because you can tell your stories a little bit more efficiently if you know those rules. But, you know, some, sometimes your heart is just wild and it does what it wants to do and you just roll with it. And I guess that's what I did here. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's going to bother me because now I'm like, oh, there's too many water lilies when it's probably not even a problem and I'm probably the only person who really cares about that so once I allowed it to fully dry and I finished it up it's time to pull out the watercolor pencils I use watercolor pencils in most of my watercolor illustrations to add in some of those final details to add in some of those shadows and to add in some opacity it can be really useful in kind of adjusting the final color balance and this is where I noticed the paper had started to ripple. It had dried, kind of pulled out and rippled. And it wanted to kind of buckle and kip. It was a little bit like working on a ship or something because I would push down and it would pop. And then it would pop back up. And that makes it harder to do really small, delicate details and fine adjustments. And it's with the watercolor pencils that I really started to notice that because I think other than adding and removing the masking fluid, the watercolor pencils were the only time I really messed with the paper during the painting process that the paper had been really dry and where applying pressure might have caused a problem. So I wanted to point this out to you guys because... You know, if you do really fine, delicate art and you use a lot of masking fluid, and I know I, I'm actually thinking of a couple of friends in mine who do beautiful art who would be very interested in knowing that the masking fluid warped my paper and they would not be able to ink on top of it again later. So that's kind of the mindset I'm coming from. But if you don't really use watercolor pencils or you aren't going to use masking fluid, and you're not doing small details if you're painting larger things and you're doing a lot of wet into wet, you're probably never going to notice those problems. So I allowed it to dry again fully and now I'm trying to re-ink it a little bit for contrast. And generally what this does is when we've done watercolor and we've painted on top of our line art, some of our colors are probably going to be opaque and they're gonna obscure the line art and they're gonna make it look kind of muddy which can make your watercolor illustration look kind of dull. So re-inking it with the same color or contrasting colors, you know, think of re-inking it as a tool to increase your art and to improve your art, okay? So re-inking it readjusts the contrast. You don't have to re-ink the whole thing. I typically just re-ink areas that need more clarity or need more contrast. So often it's used to add some additional shadow like I'm doing, I'm inking the bottoms of the water lilies here and I added some ink to her hair but the problem with this is you really need that paper to hold still so that you can draw good looking lines on top of your existing lines and not make a total mess of things and if your paper has dried warped and buckled as you ink on it it's not going to hold still it's going to buckle and pop back and forth and it's going to make inking it so much harder. So I didn't re-ink this as much as I would have liked because of those buckling issues. So it did end up causing quite a problem. I think it was my fault. I think it was how I handled the masking fluid. I think I did too much masking fluid this time. So I think it's my error, but I do want to disclose it to you guys so that if you are buying this or if you're considering buying this, you know that and you can make an educated decision. But even at this point, I still hadn't realized this paper is a mixed fiber paper. I didn't realize that until I was working on writing up the review and gathering information and getting links and that's when I found it out. So up until this point, I was handling this paper the same way I would handle any 100% cotton rag block, throwing the same challenges at it, throwing the same expectations at it, and honestly, it didn't really disappoint. There were some issues, there were some minor problems, but nothing that would stop me from using this paper again in the future and maybe just slightly modifying what I expect this paper to do or my order of operations in how I handle the materials that I'm using to paint or uh, I don't know, maybe less masking fluid. 
the paper itself held to the block really well. The block did a great job of holding the paper in place. I didn't have it crack or remove from the block. There wasn't any major buckling or kipping, just kind of the areas where the masking fluid was and the center of the block. So that's something to kind of keep in mind. And I didn't notice any sloughing of the paint. It, the paint didn't turn to mud. It didn't just totally re-lift up. It, <laughs> it didn't have any of the catastrophic fails that I've had with other papers. And removing the masking fluid didn't totally chew up the paper surface the way it did with the Arteza. Oh man, you guys got to watch the Arteza review. The art for that turned out gorgeous, but that paper fought me every step of the way. That paper was a nightmare for what I had in mind. It just totally did not want the masking fluid and it were not friends. It had no interest in being friends. Y'all got to watch that if you're interested in round watercolor blocks or interested in seeing me suffer or like watching me make art because that video hits all those points. Here's a quick demonstration just to show you guys how much the paper did actually end up buckling up. I think that's significant enough to show you guys and make it a point to mention it. Here is my completed watercolor illustration on the Paul Rubens 50% cotton round watercolor block. I think it turned out gorgeous. I know I had some critiques for my own art in there. I also had some critiques about the Paul Rubens block, but I'm really happy with how it turned out. All that's really left is to use a palette knife to very carefully remove it from the block. So we're gonna find the opening, insert our palette knife and just gently pull all the way around. It's really simple to do. And I had no issues removing the paper from the block. Now, after removing the paper, I did notice a little bit of seepage onto the next page. It's not too bad. That's not an unusual problem to have, but it does, it can cause some paper waste. And I did want to point it out because I think you guys should be aware of that. But you guys saw how much water and color I threw at this block. Considering how much water I threw at this, I, I think that amount of seepage is actually incredible incredibly reasonable and if you don't do as many layers and as much saturation as I did especially around the edges of the block you probably won't have any seepage at all. So for this to be as fair a review as possible, I thought it'd be a good idea to go ahead and talk about some of the other round block bound watercolor pads that I've reviewed here on the channel. Most of these are cotton rag with one exception. There are some other round watercolor blocks that I'm going to talk about in the future, but since I haven't done a field test on those yet, I don't want to include them at this time. So over here we have the Paul Rubens as well as two watercolor illustrations that I did on the smaller block. I thought working on the larger block would fix some of the problems I had with the smaller block. And really, I probably shouldn't have even tried to use masking fluid on this because now that I'm looking at the two field tests, I remember using masking fluid on the echinacea over there and it wrecking the paper surface. And that's something I noticed with this as well. In fact, it seems like a lot of these papers just don't take masking fluid all that well. So one of the nice things about the Paul Rubens is it is available in larger sizes without costing an arm and a leg. The Toscano over here is one of the nicer papers that I've reviewed, but it can be pretty pricey. So it's, it's kind of... <laughs> A hardship, it's kind of a tough decision to go ahead and decide to move to the larger format, especially if you like working smaller like this. So this is the glow watercolor illustration that I did on it, kind of as a field test, but also because I just wanted to paint on this paper. 
And one commonality between all of these is that all of these had a penciled illustration that I then went ahead and inked and then watercolored on top of it. Most of them have also had masking fluid applied to them, like this one, the bubble effects were masked out. Some of them take masking fluid better than others. One of the worst for masking fluid is the Arteza cotton rag watercolor block over here, which it also is kind of pricey for the quality that you get. And while the illustration turned out super cute, I had to repaint and re-ink and fix a lot of it because this paper just doesn't take masking fluid well at all. I don't know if it's a surface sizing issue or the way the fibers are manufactured, but this one is more like the Strathmore cotton rag mixed media paper than it is like a watercolor paper. There isn't a lot of sizing and it doesn't have like, it has a very like even kind of fabric like texture compared to some of the other cold presses that I've talked about. And then finally, we have the only cellulose based watercolor pad on the table, the Dora Art. And this one has a place here mostly as a mixed media pad. It takes watercolor and it takes alcohol markers decently well. This is this year's New Year's illustration where I masked out the stars as part of it. So this is marker and then the rest of it is watercolor. This is the year prior. A very similar technique was used for this and as you guys can see it does take masking fluid rather well. And then over here is the graphitint uh, field test where I was hoping for more granulation but the uh, Graphitin just doesn't really have that to offer. But of these papers, I won't say the Door Arts is the best because it's not the best quality. It's a cellulose paper, but it's a lot of fun and it performs better than you would expect it to. So I really like the Dora Art paper. And if you're looking for kind of a fun all-rounder that isn't too expensive, the Dora Art is a good way to go. If you're looking for more of a fine art paper that can take a lot of techniques, then the Toscano is probably a good idea. But this size is kind of small to work with. I also purchased their hot press since I like their cold press. And I look forward to painting on that and sharing that with you guys in the near future. The Arteza, in my opinion, is overpriced. It's kind of nobody's boy in that it's not really g good at anything and the price point is high. And I noticed the Paul Rubens has some of the same problems that the Arteza has in terms of blendability. This one though, all, any colors I put on this paper would reactivate. So I had a lot of color control issues. I couldn't layer it the way I'm used to layering a watercolor illustration. Layering was absolutely not a problem on the Paul Rubens paper. I was kind of struggling with the opacity, but that's more of an issue with the Paul Rubens tubes than it really is with the Paul Rubens paper. And I believe I used the tubes for this as well, but I might be wrong. I might've used the Core Mini palette for that. Unfortunately, this paper has some other issues in that it doesn't want to dry flat. Like, I don't know if it's the larger size or if it's the paper or what, but once it got really wet and I started using masking fluid and kind of pulling at the surface and possibly damaging the surface, just through regular wear and tear, like normal watercolor use, it never dried as taut as it was to begin with. And the Arteza wood and the Magnani Toscano wood, and even the door art will. So that's, it causes problems later on with the illustration I've found. So I kind of just wanted to show you guys some of your options when it comes to watercolor rounds. I find the round format to be really fun and inspiring. It definitely allows for just kind of a different sort of composition. And to me, as you guys can see, there's a lot of like magic themes here or fireworks or light effect themes. Um, I find that it really lends itself well to kind of like a magical realism or sort of a magical vibe. Let's talk about the pros and cons of the round Paul Rubens block. So I actually don't have a lot of pros listed, but it's not because I didn't like this paper. It's because I didn't take notes on every single thing because I just kind of fell into painting. So we'll call that a pro. It was kind of like effortless, easy. I didn't have to think about it. It didn't throw up any weird problems. It didn't do anything unusual. It was a well-behaved paper. Another pro is the price. $15.98 at the time of the review is a total steal, even for a mixed fiber paper like this one, especially block 
block bound because those do tend to be more expensive. Now, there are some cons, but those are more exceptions that stood out to me. I enjoyed painting on this paper and I'm going to continue to use this block. Knowing that it's a mixed fiber, I am going to handle it a bit differently in the future and I'll probably make better use of it then. The glue binding it stayed tight even if the paper warped. So what are the cons? As I kept mentioning earlier, this is only 50% cotton rag and I don't feel the packaging did a good enough job disclosing that. So it did actually have some weird handling issues which I think tie in with the fact that it's a mixed fiber paper. But although the listing says it's 50% cotton, the package itself just says cotton, which could lead customers to believe that it's 100% cotton. The AliExpress listing also says 50% cotton. So I'd like to see Paul Rubens actually disclose that on the package itself, even if it's just a sticker. Another con is that this paper can't really handle masking fluid very well and that was even more apparent with the smaller Paul Rubens block that I reviewed a while back for you guys. But that is a common issue with mixed fiber papers and if I had known this was mixed fiber, I wouldn't have used masking fluid. Blendability on this paper is also weird, which is yet again another mixed fiber issue. I would have handled the blending a little bit differently if I had known it was a mixed fiber. The pigment or the water and pigment soak into the paper immediately and then it's challenging to get it to move. It is available in coarse and fine grain. I reviewed the coarse grain, the blue cover, but I didn't find the paper texture to be overly assertive. I guess fine grain might be similar to hot press. So I feel like the fact that this is a mixed fiber paper makes it pretty similar to the Mare Teeny block that I have that I'll review for you guys soon. Nagging about the fact that this is a mixed fiber block and doesn't disclose that aside, what is my verdict on the Paul Rubens watercolor round block? I enjoyed working on this block. While there are things I wish I'd handled differently and the inability to confidently re-ink the piece to adjust the opacity and fix clarity issues does kind of bum me out. I like the illustration that I created and I'm happy to share it with you guys. I felt like for the most part, this paper handled everything I threw at it well and Joseph's already put in dibs for this illustration to put above his desk. So it's already been spoken for. My biggest note is to know that this is a mixed fiber paper. It is not 100% cotton and the packaging is a bit misleading about that, but the listings themselves are clear. So listen to the listings. And since it's not a full fiber paper, you do need to adjust your expectations about dry times. It is going to need longer to dry fully. That's just a problem that is common to mixed fiber papers. I would not recommend using masking fluid on this, at least not over important areas like masking out dewdrops and speckles is probably fine. Once this paper warps, it dries warped and it won't dry taut again. So if you're gonna work this paper a lot, it might not stand up to re-inking or watercolor pencils. So that's something important to keep in mind. I wanna thank you guys so much for joining me today, testing out this Paul Rubens watercolor block and putting it to the field test. I hope you guys found this to be useful, helpful, and informative. If you did, make sure you leave me a big old thumbs up. If there's another watercolor paper you'd like to see me review, let me know down in the comments. And if you're new here, please consider subscribing and hitting the bell notification. Immense! Thank you, huge thank you to my amazing patrons on Patreon. They make reviews like this possible. I use the funds from Patreon to buy the supplies that I review here on the channel. So thank you guys so much.